I think teaching is a political act. Curriculum design is a political decision. And if you're not thinking about what you're putting into the curriculum, and also, more importantly, what you're keeping out of the curriculum, I think that you're doing a disservice to your students. I think that, um, you know, as a white man, I have to also think about my identity when it comes to being a white man, um, my privilege that comes from that. I'm also a college-educated white man, and um, when I make decisions about the curriculum that I put into place, I have to be aware that I'm carrying a set of values. And I often ask myself, like, what are my students interested in? What am I interested in? And how can I explore with them? How can I develop an understanding? Like, the first thing you really need to do is explore your own identity. Um, one of my favorite professors in college used to say, we teach who we are. And so if you're not deeply connected to who you are um, and how you've gotten to be where you are, uh, you can't really get into this equity work. If you really wanna shift into being more of an equity-focused educator, um, and, like truly listen to your students. Um, don't just pretend to listen. Um, really hear them and build around that work. I have this core belief that like, if I don't know who they are, how can I be a good teacher to them? And how can I actually preach that I care if I don't know anything about them? I think that kids need to know you care and are interested in their lives in some way for them to learn from you. If you ask kids like, what, who was your favorite teacher and why? They'll say, my favorite teacher was this teacher because she cared so much. Um, she cared so much about the, the curriculum, or she cared so much about reading, she made me fall in love with reading, or she cared so much about me, she was the first teacher that told me I was able to do X. Like, across the board, kids say that. Kids never really say, like, oh, I liked this teacher because she had a good way to teach, like, calculus or something. It's always, like, rooted in caring, and then I think it builds out into concepts and competencies and equations. So if you haven't really invested in really predictable routines and procedures, if you aren't investing in like really strong planning of curriculum, if you aren't really thinking about how kids have voice and choice and flexibility in their learning environment, there's going to be a lot more unmet need. I have 28 kids in a class and probably there are days where a kid needs something and I don't I don't get there, right? But I do try to think about it in terms of like tiered intervention. So like tier one, like what do we know all kids need? All kids need safe and predictable learning environments and routines. Okay, so if I've done that and that is something that's consistent in my class, then I'm meeting a set of needs by doing that. Okay, tier two thing, some kids need a flexible space to learn. Like they need to be able to get out of their seats, they need to lay on the floor, they need a wobble stool, they need a high table, they need whatever they need. All right, so I've got those things as tier two things. Oh, you're somebody who really gets overstimulated? I also have noise canceling headphones. You're somebody who needs fidgets? I've got those things. And then there's a tier three of the kid who's like really either imploding or exploding. And then I'm trying to figure out how to, how to meet that kid's needs. Um, maybe that struggle is an emotional struggle. Maybe it's that they're hungry. Maybe it could be a lot of different reasons, but it allows you to then focus on like the four kids or the five kids who are really pressing that day because the other 23 kids like are having their needs met by the structures and systems that you've set up. They're, they're making decisions about what they need. I'm making sure all the things they need are in the space. I'm not deciding who gets the wobble stool. I'm saying I have six of them. If you need one, go get it. Chair and stretch, like here are some options, right? You being fidgety is not a thing to punish you for. Like there's nothing wrong with you feeling fidgety. We should be creating environments to re that respond to who they are, not punishing them for who they are. I have to teach you as a human first. I have to figure you out. I feel like the older kids get, the less that becomes a priority and the more people are like, well, you figure you out and let me know when you're ready to learn. And I actually think that's a problem. Like I think that at all ages, uh, the relationship is first. As an engineering teacher, like my, my big dream hope is that they all see engineering as a possible career and that some or a lot of them decide that that's what they want to do. Like we try to make the projects really relatable so kids are excited about them. Like kids are super excited about building their video games. We like try to take those tie-in points and make them really real for the kids so that the part where like they haven't been exposed to it before, where it doesn't feel like it's their area, feels like less daunting. We'll try to bring students into tech companies and we'll try to get a diverse kind of panel for them to talk to. So like we can kind of break that myth. But it is hard because they're just like, there are less like 
minority, like non-white people, black coders. So I think my first year here especially, I got called racist a lot. Like, um, I think one, like the classroom management stuff was really difficult. And so kids felt like I was calling them out. And when they felt called out, they would be like, well, you're just being racist. So that was really difficult just to start off with. I think it, it, it takes a lot of self-reflection. And we had a lot of conversations about that. Like I pulled in advisors they cared about and like we all sat down and they were like, hey, these are the things that are happening and like, here's my intention. And they were like, here's how we're perceiving it. And we worked through that and like those relationships have improved a lot, but it wasn't easy. And like, it didn't feel good. It like feels better now that like we've worked through those things. But the reality is, is like, I'm a white teacher who didn't grow up in Oakland coming into this community and trying to teach kids something that they don't really relate to a lot of the time. For all my students, I really hope that they come away understanding that they can solve problems and that they can like, struggle through when things fail. But for a lot of like engineering classes, like you try to build something and it like blows up in your face. And then you like go back and you're like, all right, why did this blow up in my face? And so really like having that resilience and ability to face challenges and just like be like, okay, this problem happened and like now we have to figure out why and fix it. And like that's a, that's a kind of universal skill I hope all of them come away with. We try to do things that are really student led. So it's not just like me talking to them for long periods of time. And I think when we do it that way, even though that class has 21 students, I get to spend one-on-one -on -one time with them because they're not expecting me to feed them stuff the whole time. Like I can make my rounds and sit with them. I think any student benefits from like an organic back and forth with their instructor. And I think some of our students, um, especially a lot of our students of color who've come from other middle schools where I know they did not get that time, they weren't afforded the opportunity to think something out. Like they were expected to like listen to something and regurgitate it. And if they weren't able to do that in a timely manner, that meant something about their ability to make a connection. And so I think for some of them, we're playing like catch up. Like it's cool if we just sit here and like think about it. Like you don't have to spit it out. And if you don't spit it out immediately, it doesn't mean anything about like your ability. Um, to make connections. It gives them the opportunity to, to slow down um, because that's what, that's what I think students who, students who the system is really built for get the time to do that. They get the time to do that. Some of those students never got that opportunity. So they were never, they weren't encouraged to like think aloud. I think one of the biggest ways we do it is we try to offer many ways to show that you know what you know. And as a team, we try to scaffold everything a lot. And students can show us that they've mastered a skill in a number of ways. So they can do it in a written format. Um, they might be able to do it in a vlog. I think what's most important is that students are all exposed to the same thing. It's like the experience of, it's like getting to experience that rigor and also knowing that like you are also worthy enough to take this class.